Hi, everyone, and thanks for joining us for today's Webinar Wednesday from GE Additive. For those of you who have joined us for previous webinars, welcome back. And for those of you who are joining us for the first time, welcome. I'm Allison. I'm the moderator for today's webinar. I'd like to first share a few housekeeping items before we get started. At the bottom of your screen, you'll find multiple engagement tools which you can use. All of these engagement tools are resizable and movable, so feel free to move them around to get the most out of your desktop space. You also have the option to expand the slides or maximize them to full screen by clicking the arrows in the top right corner. I'll ask that you please complete our short survey that will pop up for you at the end of the webinar to share with us how your experience was today and let us know about any other topics you'd like to hear about in the future. We do have materials that are available for you in the resource list, and I encourage you to download any resources that you may find useful. Now that we've gone through how to make the most of your viewing experience, let's get to today's webinar. So I'm so thrilled to share that today we have my colleague, Lindsay Kibler, joining us. Lindsay is the lead materials application engineer working in GE Additive's AdWorks Engineering Consulting Organization. Lindsay works with our customers to develop the best material solutions for their applications, consulting on all aspects of the additive ecosystem from a materials perspective. She has developed machine parameters, led characterization programs, and consulted with numerous customers on material performance and selection. Lindsay specializes in nickel, aluminum, and titanium alloys for our laser powder bed fusion platforms. Lindsay joined GE Power in 2013 as part of our Edison Engineering Development Program and has held various roles across the power industry during her first two years with the company. In 2015, she joined the Gas Turbine Advanced Component Design Team as a mechanical design engineer, where she led the design, development, and validation of an added component from conceptual design through to production. Through this experience, Lindsay not only learned how to design for additive, but also how to industrialize it. Lindsay holds a Bachelor of Science in Material Science and Engineering from Virginia Tech and a Master of Material Science and Engineering from North Carolina State University. Every single action or decision you make during the additive manufacturing process has an impact on the in-state material, material properties of your finished part. Lindsay's presentation today will look at topics like metal powder characteristics, machine hardware and process settings, part geometry, and thermal processing and surface treatments, and the effects of each on material properties. If you have any questions for Lindsay during today's webinar, please feel free to submit them using the Q&A section, which is located on the right-hand side of your screen. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can at the end of the webinar. And with that, I will welcome Lindsay to get us started. Hey, Allison. And hello, hello everyone. Um, as Allison mentioned, my name is Lindsay Kibler, and today we are going to talk about uh, materials engineering in additive manufacturing from powder to production. So I'll start off by highlighting the, the different steps of the additive process. So we'll start with additive metal powder, uh, which will be fed into the machine. So what we're showing here are examples of uh, laser powder bed fusion and electron beam powder bed fusion on our concept laser and RCAM platforms, respectively. And the machines will produce a part, which will then go through thermal processing and other post-processing steps um, before finalizing the optimized microstructure. So that microstructure is what will set your material properties. So which steps of these process of this process actually influence your material properties? Well, really it's all of them. So uh, from the metal powder perspective, so starting with, with the powder, we care about chemistry, particle size distribution, or PSD, morphology flowability, um, and powder reuse. And all of those will then affect how the powder behaves in the machine and ultimately how the material characteristics will, will come out. So from there we go to the machine and there are several aspects of the machine that will also influence your process, including the OEM, so the make of the, of the machine and its model. Uh, the serial number, so sometimes you can see 
machine-to-machine uh, -machine variation, uh, what atmosphere you're using to, to print the parts. So on our laser side, we have two options for shield gas, uh, including argon and nitrogen. And then on the electron beam side, uh, the environment is under a vacuum. So the software version can also have an effect, the machine setup itself, and the recoder material and shape. So additionally, on the machine side, uh, there are a set of parameters that will affect how your beam and how your uh, additive process is, is formed. So these parameters include layer thickness, beam power, power and speed, the beam spot size, and the scan strategy for your bulk and your contour settings. And we'll get to those, uh, what that means in just a few slides. And then the gas flow in the machine. So from there, the, the part itself can also have an influence, um, including the, the layout of the part inside the machine, how you're scanning those parts. So if there's multiple parts on, the, on a machine um, in one single build, uh, what order are you scanning those parts in? And uh, any in-process monitoring that could be applicable to, to change the process during the build. So from there, uh, like I said before, that's not where the process stops. So we'll go into thermal processing after that. Uh, so any thermal treatments, uh, heat treatment, stress relief, HIP, uh, solution and age are, are the common uh, stress relief or uh, thermal cycles that, that we'll run. And then any surface treatments such as machining or um, polishing or, or anything along those lines. And then if there's any additional joining steps, those have to be considered as well. And everything leading up to, to this step is then going to influence your material characteristics. So what we're concerned about here is the microstructure, uh, the porosity that you see in the part, what those pore sizes are and the shape and location of those pores, because each of those will have a different effect on, on the material properties, and then surface characteristics. So then each of these uh, feed into and, and strongly affect what your material properties look like. So everything from from physical properties such as electrical and thermal properties to and density to tensile fatigue, creep, and, and ultimately crack growth as well. Great. So it's time for our first poll question where we would like to hear from you guys um, in the audience. The question is, what is your most significant challenge to additive adoption from a materials perspective? So the options are that you have a lack of material property allowables, a lack of industry specification for additive materials, variability within a build, variability machine to machine, or a lack of understanding of additive process variables. Once again, what is your most significant challenge to additive adoption from... Mm -hmm. So just taking a look at the results here, it looks like um, the, most, uh, the most common answers are lack of material property allowables, lack of industry specs, and lack of understanding of additive process variables. And um, honestly, I think that's, that's quite consistent with, um, with my experience on um, you know, helping our, our customers get to uh, a good um, additive story. So. Um, just wanted to make a plug um, for uh, our, our AdWorks um, team can help you with um, consulting on each of these uh, different, different steps. So from here, we'll, we'll move on to our, our metal additive uh, powder and the characteristics that that we care about um, from a powder perspective. So firstly, uh, the particle morphology of the powder is 
is really important to the ultimate characteristics. So morphology is, is another word for shape for the powder. So what I'm showing here is several different shapes of powder that are results of different uh, powder manufacturing processes. So you can get anything from an angular or acicular particle if you use an, um, a, crush, a crushing uh, method um, to a dendritic structure if you use an electrolytic process uh, to a porous or a flake structure if you use sintering or ball milling. Um, but when we look at an additive process, um, our target is really the spherical shape, um, a consistent spherical shape that you typically get from gas or plasma or sometimes even water atomization. Uh, this, this spherical shape will allow the powder to uh, not only um, flow through the machine properly, but also once it's in the powder bed, uh, will allow for, for a good packing density uh, so that you can um, on, weld on some good packed powder. In addition to, to morphology, uh, particle size distribution, or PSD, and chemistry are also very important to, to the um, additive powder. So what I'm showing here is two different samples of 316 powder. Uh, sample one, um, you're, you can see the chemistry here in, in the table on, on the left, and then uh, the particle size distribution uh, in the table on the right. And you can see that between sample one and sample two, the chemistries and particle size distributions are actually very similar. So one could potentially expect similar behavior from these two samples of powder. Uh, however, that's not the only thing that you need to consider. So uh, what we're showing here is, is actual SEM images of sample one versus sample two. And you can see that the shape of the, of the particles and the morphology is quite different. So on the, the gas atomized powder uh, shows a lot more spherical particles that are, are much more consistent in shape and size, uh, whereas the water atomization uh, can result in some, uh, some inconsistencies in the morphology. And this morphology difference will definitely have an effect on how the powder flows in the machine and how it's packed in the powder bed. So you could potentially expect re different results from these two samples of powder. So when you're uh, selecting and specifying additive powders, uh, you need to pay attention to more than just particle size, distribution, and chemistry. And taking one step further on particle size distribution, uh, we're showing some examples here of just the different additive processes that are available and what particle size distribution ranges you can expect for each of those processes. So because of the inherent differences between the processes, uh, we recommend different particle sizes for each of these processes. So on the MIM and binder jet side, there, uh, we typically use a much smaller, finer particle size distribution. As you get into the laser powder bed fusion, the particle size increases slightly. And then even from there, electron beam increases even further due to the increased uh, energy input and increased layer thickness that we use for that process. And then uh, DED is one of the, um, uses the higher end of the, of the powder size distribution spectrum. So now we'll show a short video on our uh, AP and C asthma plasmatization process. The atomization process begins with a solid wire being fed from a spool into the atomization unit. Using a wire instead of a metal stream allows for greater control over the feed process, granting improved stability and accuracy during this stage. In a single step, high temperature plasma torches melt and atomize a small section of the wire. The two-story tall atomizer is large enough to provide the necessary residence time for the particles to form and settle in the most optimal manner. The surface tension of the atomized particles reforms them into even spherical shapes. At the same time, residual argon gas is allowed to escape from the particle. 
This process avoids irregularly shaped particles and gas pockets that are typical with cold gas atomization. Fully formed particles typically range from 0 to 180 microns. They are highly spherical powders with superior flowability, low porosity in satellites, and feature device compatibility across all additive manufacturing modalities. So as you saw in the video, APNC's advanced plasma atomization process yields some very consistent and very, um, very high quality powders. So what we're uh, showing here is the current product portfolio for APNC powders. So what's currently available today are uh, titanium alloys, such as Ti-6-4, commercial, commercially pure Ti, uh, TIE 5353 and 6242 and nitinol. Uh, we also offer nickel super alloys such as 718 and 625. And then new in 2019, APNC has introduced uh, aluminum alloys, uh, so ALSI 10 mag and ALSI 7 mag or F357. There are also some alloys in the pipeline and uh, other alloys can be accepted and atomized upon request. So if you have an atomization request, feel free to reach out to APNC to see if they can meet your needs. All right, so now we're going to talk about additive process parameters and how each of these will influence uh, material properties. So when developing a parameter, uh, a parameter development program, there are several requirements that need to be taken into account. So most of the, the big requirements that, that we'll focus on for the most part are density, productivity, stability of the weld, surface quality, and mechanical and fatigue properties. So uh, on the density side there are two types of, ten of density that we typically look at. So the density in, in the bulk or the uh, the, the large section of the part, and then anything close to the edge of the part, uh, since that's using a different parameter, will be influenced by, by different, um, different modalities. So uh, we can look at subcontour porosity and then porosity within the contour pass as well. Obviously, productivity is, is a big player for, for a lot of our customers. So um, we will typically have to balance productivity with a lot of these other properties and requirements. So as we look at these requirements and how they relate to the specific parameters, uh, density, productivity, uh, our bulk mechanical properties, and st overall stability of the weld are largely influenced by the bulk parameter. So that, that bulk parameter, like I mentioned, mentioned before, scans the, the vast majority of the part. And then we'll come back with a contour parameter that uh, will smooth out the edges and um, usually is a slower parameter so that you can um, have your speed in, in the bulk of the part and then trace the outside of the part with a slower parameter to get a nice good surface finish. So that contour parameter is going to affect your, uh, your surface quality and your, and your resulting fatigue properties. However, like I mentioned, a lot of these requirements are, um, are inversely related. So there will be some trade-offs as you go through development. The biggest one uh, is productivity. So productivity has, as you increase productivity, will have a large influence on density, surface quality, and your resulting mechanical properties. And we will we'll go into a few more details and examples in, in the coming slides. So when one looks at additive material development, there are several parameters throughout the entire additive process that will impact the material performance. So we talked about some of these in the powder specification. So now we're going to talk about everything related to the machine. So the beam parameters, the hatch strategy, the coating parameters, and the build chamber are all going to influence your material properties at a machine level.
And when we talk about hatch or bulk uh, uh, parameters versus contour parameters, you can see in the upper right image that when we talk about hatch or bulk, sometimes those words can be used interchangeably, that that is really talking about um, filling in the interior of the part. We'll then come back with a contour pass, which is shown in the green, and outline part, um, which will then follow the part boundary. So within those parameters, there are several things that will uh, that we can change that will affect each of those uh, properties. So starting with the beam parameters, spot size, power, dwell time, and travel speed are all big influencers on, on what your resulting properties will look like. From there, the hatch strategy. So within that hatch or bulk setting and um, how you're, you're going to trace the part from both the hatch and a contour uh, perspective, um, a lot of your uh, spacing uh, spacing options will, will have an influence, um, what the overlap is between the boundaries, and things such as contour passes and skywriting will influence it as well. So we're going to take a specific look at our bulk parameter development. And like I mentioned before, this is the, the parameter that uh, fills in the vast majority of the interior of the part. So what I'm showing here on the left is the influence, the impact of, of line energy and its influence on, on how your beam and your weld pool form. So you can see in the single tracks at the top that as you increase your line energy, your, your single track will um, go from a staggered and um, inconsistent track to a fully formed um, consistent straight track on as you progress to the right. On the bottom, once you connect those single tracks together, as you increase your line energy, there is a point at which uh, there's an undesirable high line energy uh, where you can see on the on the right there that your, your tracks are overlapping a little too much and start to see some swelling at the ends of the at the ends of the tracks. So this was also made apparent in different types of porosity. So the images I'm showing on the right are uh, the different types of porosity that you can see depending on uh, how much energy input you have into the part. So uh, we're showing keyhole porosity, lack of fusion porosity, and gas porosity. So once your, your bulk parameter is, um, is optimized, we'll then take a look at the contour porosity, the, the contour parameter, and look at the, the effects of line energy on, on those settings as well. So you can see on the left, I'm showing a vertical wall and the effect of increasing line energy and what that looks like in, in the resulting parts. So starting from, from the left side, uh, if your line energy is too low, you'll get some extra powder that's sticking to the surface. Um, and as you increase your line energy, you can start to see if you increase it too far, you'll get keyhole porosity in the contour itself. Additionally, if your contour and your, your bulk parameters uh, do have the correct overlap settings, you can start to see some porosity between those two parameters in that bottom image. So we're looking for a good balance um, between uh, inline energy, as you can see in that center optimal picture. This also applies to a, to a downside surface. And what we're showing here, um, a downside surface is, is anything that has an overhang angle to the plate. So the images uh, are shown, shown here are um, with, the, with the plate orientation at the bottom of the slide. And your, your line energy also plays a really um, important role here because as you can see in, in the cartoon images, if you have a, uh, a large spot size versus a small spot size with an overhang angle, that will definitely impact how deep your, your beam is penetrating and how much resulting powder on, that, on the bottom side of your surface will adhere and, and stick to that surface. 
So you can see the changes in roughness as you uh, increase line energy. And again, we look for something in the middle and it, it changes with material um, that, that will try to target this optimal setting in the center. So now we're going to take a closer look at what the effects of increased productivity are on the resulting material properties. So we have a few big levers to, to increase productivity, and those are layer thickness, scan speed, and hatch distance. So if you increase any or all three of these, these, uh, these properties, there will be some, some effects on, on your resulting uh, density and, and other properties. So if you, if you try to increase uh, these layer thicknesses and hatch distances and scan speeds without affecting, without changing any of your other parameters like, like beam power and spot size, then it can definitely lead to a lower surface quality, a lower increased porosity or lower density. Uh, you won't have as much remelting or track overlap, which is then gonna cause that, that density. And as a result, you'll have reduced ductility. So what we're showing on the right is a spider chart comparing each of three different layer thicknesses. And this example is aluminum, silicon, TED magnesium. Uh, and the, the effects of the different layer thicknesses, holding everything else constant on your material properties. So the red line is a 30 micron parameter, the blue line is a 40 micron parameter, and the green line is a 60 micron parameter. So you can see a significant uh, decrease in density and uh, uh, increase, increase in, in vertical surface finish, so decrease in quality of the surfaces. Um, on both the vertical and the downside surfaces, and a, de and a decrease in ductility. However, your productivity goes way up. So if there is an application where mechanical integrity is not quite as important, but you do need a, to produce something very quickly, uh, this is where balancing these, these requirements based on the application comes into play. So we at GE Additive develop parameters for our machines and make them available for, for our customers. And um, we have several different levels of, of what those parameters look like. So uh, we have base parameters, which start out in this, on the, on the scale of material performance and build rate. Uh, these base parameters are a good balance between uh, properties and build rate and have a, a good amount of flexibility in, in um, ap application requirements. So these can also be um, available in varying layer thicknesses for some materials, um, and these are open and editable with, with CL Works. So beyond these base parameters, we also offer premium plus parameters. And we will customize and tailor uh, these premium plus parameters um, according to, to several different um, uh, requirements that we were showing on the previous slides. So the products that we offer are a productivity plus parameter, which as I, as I just mentioned, as you increase productivity, some of your material performance um, might suffer. So this, um, this productivity plus parameter has a very high build rate and uh, good surface quality and um, mechanical performance. On the other side of the spectrum, the, uh, we offer a surface plus parameter, which has a very good surface finish, high surface quality with a standard uh, build rate. So um, you won't see the increase in productivity on that parameter. And then we also offer balanced plus parameters, which is a balance of a high build rate and surface quality. So these parameters are um, usually much more intense to uh, require a lot more development time um, because of uh, the, just the difficulty in balancing material performance and, and build rate. So some examples of where you might want um, a, a good surface finish and at the, at the expense of productivity is um, any application where you might need um, some fatigue benefit and you can't machine the surface 
So we'll talk about the implications of that in a few slides. Um, but one way to do to increase your surface uh, quality is to decrease your layer thickness, as we as I just showed. So um, some of our uh, surface plus parameters and our productivity plus parameters are going to be available in different uh, layer thicknesses. So our GE additive material parameters that we have available today are shown in this slide, both for our concept laser, uh, laser powder bed fusion process, and on our RCAM platforms. So we have base parameters available on the laser side for aluminum, cobalt, iron-based alloys, nickel, titanium, um, and copper. And on the RCAM side, we have a cobalt chrome parameter available, um, 718, and then several of the titanium alloys, um, as well as copper. So I also wanted to point out that designing for additive does create an opportunity for uh, substituting a material uh, based on what's available today. So um, if you are, if you have an application that is using a material today that's not on this list, uh, designing for additive can allow you to substitute that material by changing the stress profile of the part or um, just allowing a different material to be used in, in that sense. Great, so hopefully uh, my audio is a little bit better this time. So we'll, we'll move to another poll question. Second poll question for you guys is, which alloy family do you use most frequently? Aluminum, titanium, steel, nickel, cobalt, copper, or other? So one more time, which alloy family do you use most frequently? Aluminum, titanium, steel, nickel, cobalt, copper, or other? And we'll, we'll take a look at the poll results here. And once again, Lindsay, I will divert to you to comment on the results. Okay, so it looks like titanium is, is the most used among our audience today with um, aluminum, steel, and nickel all falling in that, that second category. And I think that that's pretty consistent with, with um, what I've seen and what our experience is. Um, so uh, we definitely have solutions um, among all of those alloys for, um, for both of our laser powder bed and electron beam powder bed fusion processes. All right, so now we're going to, to move on and uh, take a deeper dive into uh, what the mechanical properties um, actually look like and, and how each of these steps directly influences uh, the resulting mechanical process uh, properties. So first, how does additive mechanical properties, how do they compare to cast and forged material. So the charts that I'm showing here are for alloy, nickel alloy 718. And um, what you can see is that the, the typical uh, additive properties are definitely higher than cast um, and sometimes approaching our forged or wrought material. So um, for those of you out there who are wondering, you know, um, are aren't familiar with additive and want to know how it can compare to our traditional manufacturing processes, uh, we typically see an increase over cast properties um, and can get pretty comparable to, to raw or forged material. So how does heat treat uh, for additive materials impact the microstructure and, um, and resulting properties? So what I'm, what I'm showing here, again, this example is nickel alloy 718. Uh, so this, this, these images show the microstructure from um, the as-built state all the way through the final heat treat process. Now 718 is an age-hardenable alloy, so these particular processes may not be applicable across all of our alloys, but uh, for age-hardenable alloys, these, uh, these processes will definitely apply. So from the as-built state, you can see that there are, uh, the image on the left, 
you can see that there are um, still weld pools pretty evident in, in the structure. Um, so then we'll send that through a stress relief process to uh, reduce the internal residual stresses that are inherent to uh, the welding process. Um, and so going through this cycle will allow you to remove the, the parts from the platform with minimal distortion. So this step uh, isn't, isn't necessary for electron beam because the, um, there's a center step within the process that um, keeps the, the powder bed at a pretty high temperature. And thus, at the end of the process, there aren't as many uh, residual stresses internally as there are um, after a laser powder bed fusion. So from there, we'll often send parts through a HIP or hot isostatic pressing cycle. Uh, so this step reduces internal porosity. And for um, 718 and other alloys, it'll initiate a recrystallization of the, of the microstructure and will help in transforming the microstructure from a, um, a, an elongated state uh, in the uh, vertical direction to a more equiax state in, um, so that we can get isotropic properties in both the vertical and horizontal directions. From there, we'll go through a solution cycle, which homogenizes the microstructure and sets the grain size once you, once you quench after solution. So in this step, the strength will decrease and your ductility will increase. Finally, we'll go through an age cycle where the uh, precipitation of the strengthening phases um, increases that strength and uh, stabilizes your microstructure. So for age hardenable alloys, uh, this is definitely the balance of properties um, after this, this age cycle. So another characteristic of the additive process is surface finish. And what we're showing here is a comparison between laser powder bed and electron beam powder bed and the expected um, surface characteristics based on the process. So as you can see the, in the table, the electron beam powder bed has a larger minimum beam diameter um, and thus will we'll use uh, thicker layers typically um, for, for the powder. Um, the powder particle size is also increased on the electron beam compared to laser, uh, and thus your, your resulting surface finish on electron beam is typically higher than laser powder bed. So when you're selecting which um, uh, additive platform is right for your application, uh, surface finish is definitely a key characteristic to keep in mind. And then going beyond that, um, all of the, the factors that will influence surface finish from an additive perspective um, are layer thickness, particle size, distribution, and range, uh, your, the, the local angle of your surface. Um, so you can see in the images on, on the right that as you build up layer by layer, um, if your surface is, is steeply angled in relation to the build plate, you'll, you'll have a pretty significant overhang layer to layer. And that's what causes the increased surface roughness on those downside angles. Uh, the material itself will also affect the surface finish since each material will absorb power differently and then weld differently. Uh, gas flow on the laser side, the profile and the speed. Beam parameters, motor blade orientation, and then um, on the electron beam side, how the sintered powder is removed after the after the parts are printed. So how does surface finish affect our final material properties? So I'm showing here a case study of how surface finish impacts um, as-built fatigue properties. So um, a lot of times in additive, we will test fatigue in an as-printed surface state. So uh, you can see in the, in the cartoons here that an as-printed surface has both peaks and valleys. And in order to um, eliminate all of the valleys, you typically have to go to a machine state. So um, a lot of post-processing steps for, for additive can include bead blasts or extrude honing, um, and you can definitely decrease your RA value. 
But I want to point out that even if you decrease your, your RA or your surface finish value, oftentimes you'll still be left with these valleys. And the values are really what's impacting your, your fatigue behavior. So if you don't remove all of the valleys, they serve as crack initiation sites. You can see that um, in the chart on the right that uh, your, um, your, your fatigue properties are still somewhat debited compared to a machine surface, even though you have reduced the RA value. So as you're designing for, um, for your applications, it's important to keep, keep in mind where your fatigue limited locations are and how you'll need to process those locations to, to meet your requirements. Another example of surface uh, characteristics and their effect on fatigue is uh, looking at layer size and layer thickness. So as we discussed before, if you increase your layer thickness, you'll increase your productivity. So uh, for this particular example, we started with 20 micron layers and wanted to increase to 50 micron layers to um, improve our productivity. So once we did that and, opt and developed the parameter set for 50 micron layers, we looked at all of the material characteristics um, after developing that parameter set. So um, from bulk perspective, on the, um, for the bulk properties, all the powder, the thermal processing, the microstructure, even the surface finish and tensile capability um, were all similar. And once uh, the chart on the right is showing our uh, fatigue property is for a machine surface. So like I just mentioned, um, if you machine the, the, the surface, most of those valleys will go away and you'll really just be looking at your bulk performance for fatigue. However, when you look at the as printed surface data, we saw a debit um, for the 50 micron parameter. So there is a, a, a debit that we saw here in, in uh, stress capability for as printed fatigue. So we went back and took a look at the parameters and changed some machine and parameter settings, and were able to optimize those, those settings for, um, for this new 50 micron parameter. And we're able to then show that uh, the 50 micron data has similar capability to our 20 micron. So uh, we just wanted to highlight here that uh, traditional checks of similarity uh, might not be sufficient. So we're used to checking for density. We're used to checking for um, a lot of those bulk properties, tensile properties, um, but they may not be sufficient to, to, to assess all sources of variation within the process. So how do we apply these properties to, um, to a specific design? So as we're setting design limits, we need to take into account all of the different uh, processes and potential debits that could apply to that particular component and then that particular location within the component. So what I'm showing here in the chart is that we have an average and a, um, and a minimum uh, design limit. This example is for low cycle fatigue. And um, the, that is for the, uh, the bulk of the, of the, of the material. So then we need to account for any thermal or processing debits. So if there is, for example, a braze cycle that, um, that the part needs to go through, how is that going to affect your, your microstructure and thus your uh, material properties? Any general physical debit, so this could include, uh, for example, a, um, an as-printed surface versus a machine surface. So. Um, and as printed surface, as we've shown, could potentially have a, a debit compared to machined. So you'll need to take that into account. And then feature specific debits. So are there any local stress concentrations? Are there any features that you would expect to, um, to see to serve as crack initiation sites or to, to show um, any indications of, of lower capability? So, um, we just wanted to highlight that 
your um, your designs need to account for for each of these uh, potential debits, and your design limits should then be set to um, to be below those thresholds. Great, thanks, Lindsay. And we'll now move to our last poll question, and that is, which material material properties are most crucial to your designs? Tensile properties, such as yield strength, UTS, or elongation, strain-controlled fatigue, load-controlled fatigue, fracture toughness, density, physical properties such as thermal or electrical, or other. So once again, which mater material properties are most crucial to your designs? Check all that apply. Tensile properties, such as yield strength, UTS, or elongation, strain-controlled fatigue, load-controlled fatigue, fracture toughness, density, physical properties such as thermal or electrical or other. And we'll take a look at the poll results here. And one final time, Lindsay, I'll ask for your thoughts on the results today. All right, so it looks like uh, tensile properties and uh, are, are definitely um, far and away the most important. Um, to our audience today, followed by uh, load controlled fatigue. Um, so that's that's uh, you know just good to keep in mind um, that uh, yeah we we see that across across the industries as well um, and uh, and yeah we'll we'll keep that in consideration. So along those lines, I, I would like to highlight that. Um, we at GE do you have material property data sheets available for our um, for our laser platforms. Um, so I'm showing an example here of the um, aluminum silicon seven mag or F three fifty seven data sheet that's available for for the M two, and um, we show a lot of any any of the data that we have um, available. So in this case. We have a lot of physical data, um, so including you know surface finish and um, any thermal properties, um, and then we have tensile data also for for different thermal states and at different um, temperature test test temperatures. So uh, we're showing um, as built data and then um, how the tensile properties change after a stress relief cycle. Um, and then finally, if you go through a stress relief, hip, solution, and age, uh, we have those properties available too for this alloy. And then for F357 or ALSI 7 mag, we also have some fatigue properties that are available on our, on our data sheets. So um, we have some uh, low cycle fatigue and high cycle, so um, strain controlled and load controlled uh, fatigue properties. So um, it's good to know that these properties are of interest to our audience. Uh, so you can feel free to, to go and, um, and to check those out for yourself. And I'll also add that um, we, uh, the, the amount of data that we have for each of these alloys does vary. So um, our ALSI 7 mag is a great example of, um, of what we have available. Um, but you'll notice that that some of our alloys we um, we will have tensile and we may have different thermal states available. It just depends on the alloy. And where can you find these data sheets? Um, so go to ge.com/additive um, and you navigate to our machines page. Uh, you can check out the M2 Series Five or the um, the X line machines. Uh, those will have our data sheets available. Um, and then once you scroll down to the section where you can, where it says click on powders and printers um, to download the data sheets, um, you can click on each alloy name um, and they will, um, you'll be able to download our data sheets for free. So on our M2 platforms, I would like to point out that we are, um, you know, super excited to, to have recently released our M2 Series 5 machine and we are in the process of going through and um, validating and updating all of our parameters and thus updating our data sheets um, to to reflect that new data uh, but you can expect similar capability on the series 5 machine to that of the existing 
um, multi-laser sheets that are that are available today. All right, I think that brings us to our question and answer portion of the webinar. So thank you so much, Lindsay, again, for sharing such great information with us today. And as usual, <clears throat> we've had a uh, great um, response and questions from the audience. Um, so we'll get through as many questions as we can now. So we'll start with, can you print with multiple materials in a single part? So uh, in theory, um, yes, you technically could. Um, so I do want to point out that there are definitely some complications that, that would come up um, in, in powder handling. So if you were to you know, load, um, load your machine with one material and then want to switch to another ma a material halfway through, um, you'll have powder after that process um, that's a mix of two different alloys. So um, that could be uh, a potential, um, that could be something that's difficult to deal with. Um, additionally, if you have a, a part that's already been printed and you want to just introduce that and print on top of that, um, you know, there has been research that's, that's been done. You can find research out there, um, that, uh, you can print a new part onto an existing part. So some, some applications there, um, could include, uh, you know, cost reduction. Um, you could print the, uh, a simpler, or, um, cast a simpler part and then print a complex for part um, or, or for repair. Great, thanks, Lindsay. Okay, the next question that we have is, which alloys are being used in production today? So on our um, electron beam platform, so um, several of our, our customers, internal and external, are, are using additive in serial production. Um, today, so on the electron beam side, um, Ti64, titanium 64 is is being widely used, and then our, on our laser side, um, several uh, several alloys are being used today, such as titanium 64 again, um, 718, uh, aluminum silicon 7 mags at 357, um, and and cobalt chrome is what I can think of off the top of my head. Great, thank you. Okay, the next question we have is, what is your opinion on having different hatch parameters within a single component? So having different hatch parameters um, would, within a single component, would inherently and, and potentially change your, um, your bulk material behavior throughout the part. Um, so if you could characterize that in, in a way that um, is beneficial for your application. Um, that's a um, that it's, it's a potential, but um, I would caution uh, um, varying those those bulk parameters just because they do have such a such an uh, um, important influence <clears throat> on on the resulting material properties. And you know, we want to the name of the game here is is consistency. And um, so we want to keep a, a good consistent process throughout the build um, such that you, you, can ex you know what to expect in terms of material properties um, on the back end. Great, thank you. Okay, the next question that we have is, are there any fatigue limited components in production utilizing as printed surfaces or can it be assumed that all fatigue limited parts require post print machining? Yeah, I think, um, I think that's a great question. So um, as, as I showed before, there are, are definitely debits um, when you look at an as printed surface in terms of fatigue capability. Um, however, you know, if there are definitely several applications that are able to accept those debits um, and those as printed knockdowns. Um, even in a fatigue loaded uh, situation. So it definitely depends on your, your part requirements and the, um, the loading conditions that it will go through. Um, so if there's a critical, like a particular critical feature that um, you know, has a very specific requirement and a very stringent fatigue requirement, you may still wanna go back and machine that. 
Um, however, there are also with, um, with additive manufacturing, the design freedom that you have um, also allows you to redesign your component if possible and can change your, trust, your stress distribution to um, you know, change what those critical fatigue loaded features actually, actually end up being. Um, so I'll say, yes, there are components that, um, fatigue loaded components um, that are being used in the as printed state. Great, thank you. And we're we're getting so many great questions today. Um, they're they're coming in continuously here. So, um, the next question is, what is an ideal size of powder? So, an ideal size of powder, um, like I said, depends on your um, on the process that you're using. So, let me jump back to um, that's the slide that I had on that. So, our particle size distribution. Um, changes, again, based upon your um, the process that you want to use. Um, we will, <clears throat> for example, for, la for laser powder bed, um, there are a couple of different cuts that we would potentially source. So um, 10 to 45 microns, 15 to 53 microns, and 15 to 63 um, are the most common uh, that, that I can um, recall at the moment. And um, each of those cuts will um, potentially, but based on the material alloy and the the machine itself, and you know the powder distribution system, um, will um, you know a different cut might be more suitable for a different parameter or for a different machine or for a different application. But um, yeah, so on the laser side, typically ten to sixty three microns, and then on the electron beam side, um, more on the the forty five to 106 particle size distribution. Okay, thank you. All right, the next question that we have is, are there any alloys that were designed specifically for additive manufacturing? Yes, yeah, so um, there are definitely a lot, there's definitely a lot of research out there that um, has been going into, um, you know, specific alloys and specific chemistries that are, um, you know, directly applicable for additive. Um, I'll say some of the the harder to weld alloys. So once you start getting into um, super alloys with um, a gamma prime formation that's su um, susceptible to strain age cracking, some significant tweaks to chemistry can um, potentially help uh, tailor that that particular alloy for an additive process. Um, so, uh, however, on the other side, we also um, tend to notice that a, um, a a familiar alloy will be much easier to implement and then develop for um, an existing application. So, as as our customers and as we are adopting additive as a, a new process, um, it can definitely be helpful to to start with an alloy that you're familiar with, um, such that that alloy can then, um, you can learn on that alloy and um, be able to, to implement that um, in your current existing designs with, with little to no, um, you know, uh, changes in, in that design process. Great. All right. Thank you so much, Lindsay. I think this brings us towards the end of our time here. Um, so I would like to go ahead and wrap up and say thanks again for joining us. Um, once again, the webinar will be available on demand if you would like to listen to it again or perhaps pass it along to a friend or a colleague. And I also encourage you to register for our upcoming webinars. Uh, last, before you log off, I'll ask that you please complete our short survey that will pop up for you in a minute and share with us how your experience was today and let us know about any other topics you'd like to hear about in the future. And I look forward to seeing you guys next time on our webinar Wednesday series. Thank you.